New words, new narrative, new understanding, collaborating with other kids, learning how to get along, learning it's not your turn right now, but it will be in just a minute. These are key, key concepts that we want to teach our young kids. And they're happening once we change the lens in play. Well, hi, everybody. So today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about playful learning. And I want to have a conversation with you. I'm going to throw out some stuff just so you can say when parents say to you, seriously, you want my kids to play? I want to give you some, uh, some reasons that you do want to say yes. And that the wonderful people in the back, there's a, a great woman in the back here who taught forever in Chicago Public Schools, right? Everybody take a, take a peek here. Oh. oh, University of Chicago Preschool, okay. And, and when things started to go south and you weren't allowed to play anymore and play became a dirty word, she and many other amazing human beings said it's not good for kids. And they're here today to support us in bringing it back. So I want to talk to you about play-based learning, and, and I'm going to do it in a, in a very evidence-based way. So play with me here for just a second. <clears throat> Ready? <laughs> oh, now we're talking. Okay. <laughs> the question is, what did you hear? Yeah, thank you. What's a rhythm? you're not going to believe this, mathematics, okay? A rhythm is math. You can't do rhythms unless you can carve up time, right? You do four beats, right, in measure. That's your carving up that measure into four. You got it, guys? All right? Now, everybody will say, oh, you're just clapping. <laughs> but you weren't just clapping. What I hear when I change the lens on clapping is I see people doing remarkable stuff, like mathematics. I see people doing remarkable stuff, like waiting to hear what they heard and then imitating it, which shows executive function, attention, control, and planning. Whoa, what's going on here? Oh, it's just a little kid acting like King Arthur, right? Wrong. What is it? Playing. Just playing? Don't ever want to hear just playing. Navigating a world. What kind of a world? Imagination world. A narrative. Oh, did I say narrative? Oh, my God. That's the precursor to reading, right? Have you all heard about that? Because when you can tell a story, that's the basis for literacy. It's the basis for reading. Boom. They're planning. Who's going to be King Arthur at the night table? What are they going to do with the sword? This is, like, incredible, guys. Can you feel it now? So when I change the lens, I see language. I see social skills, I see perspective taking, I see planning, I see attention, I see memory. Listen, preschool education is on the national agenda, and it got here because of Chicago. Thank you. <laughs> and in early education, we know it's a needed investment, produces long-term returns that justify increasing investments even in hard economic times. And you know where we learned that? Professor Heckman, who teaches at? Thank you. Further, there's Common Core curriculum now. It was announced in June 2010 for the K to 12. There is talk about moving some of this into zero to five. We've got to be cautious here. Very cautious that this doesn't get misinterpreted. Because that's an easy thing to do. Sometimes, what are meant as creative benchmarks become thresholds for the new test. I am banking on you guys to not let that happen. You ready? All right. Stand up the force and say, this is a great idea. I love benchmarks. By the way, the kids will get to those benchmarks by playing King Arthur and being in the circus exhibit. We're going to help them, okay? But don't make those thresholds. It's not fair to your kids. Now, that means that all of us have a job to do here. And it means that we have to get it right. Because we don't have a choice. Our job is too important. 
Somebody makes the wrong banking investment, okay, fine, we'll deal with it. You can't make a wrong investment in young kids. And I'm going to a little bit shock you with what I think the right investment is going to be. And I'm going to put this in the terms of that banker. I'm going to help you see why that banker ought to begin to see why you're important and the most important job in the society today. It's because we're leaving an information age. Factoids simply aren't enough anymore. We're entering what's called the information age. And they tell us that information is doubling every two and a half years. Now I get that I'm old, guys. But I just to let you know how old I am, we did not have internet when I was in college. Okay? Now, are any of you, like, older than, let's say, uh, six? <laughs> then you didn't have tweets when you were a kid. You didn't have smartphones when you were a kid. Right about that? Any of you remember having YouTube when you were a kid? Right? All that has happened as you were growing up. Things are happening super fast. And if people believe that all we need to do at this point is somehow dump facts into the heads of kids, they are wrong. wrong. It ain't going to work because information's changing too fast. And if it's changing every two and a half years, even if you had that crazy idea that the way we were supposed to teach kids is that they are empty vessels and you just pull off the top of their head and you pour stuff in, even if you poured everything in that you could today, in two and a half years, you'd be at 50%. In five years, you'd be at 25%. Ten years, they'd be stupid. Okay? All right. Point is, it's not what we need to be doing. We need to teach them how to be innovative. We need to teach them how to integrate the information that they have. So I want to pose today a new idea for you. This idea is what I call the six C's. And the six C's... What I, I've just, I, you probably can't even read them from back there, right? So I'll tell you what they are. They're sort of the hard skills and softer skills. Hard skills, it's something we can really teach. Softer skills, we're not sure how to do it, but we will, okay? And here they are. Turns out it's a developmental model. It builds directly from the scientific literature. And it happens to be, for the first time in our history, the very same thing that the CEOs of Chicago are worrying about today. Think about it. For the first time, what's good for kids is good for America. Collaboration is number one. Kids need to know how to get along. You know that, right? Not new to you. If they're clobbering each other, we're in trouble. And if they clobber each other like they do down in the Congress, we're in trouble. Got it? Okay? We need to know how to collaborate. We need to know how to get along with differences. Community comes with collaboration. Diversity comes with collaboration. Second, communication. We need to know how to speak with one another, not just at. We need to understand that our world is not just to be blogged. It's meant to be interactive, right? So our children in our charge need to speak back and forth and back and forth, and that means that they can't just speak, they also need to listen. Something we're pathetically bad at. And by the way, something that our parents aren't so good at either. We're so good at filling the space that we're not really great anymore at allowing others to have their voice. Now, content is important, but content is only one of the six C's, not all of the C's. You with me? And is content just reading and math? No. Do you think we could add art? Cool. Dance? Music? Could we add maybe social studies? History? Anybody for any of this stuff? Yeah? All right. Let's get off. I'm not saying we have to ignore reading and math, very important, but it's not all there is. But of course, even if you mastered all that, in today's world with information doubling every two and a half years, what we need is critical thinking. We need to know how to navigate all the information that we have. Which blogs should we trust? Do you know how many apps there are for your phone? Which ones are good? Which ones are terrible? And who the heck knows the difference? So critical thinking. But of course, that won't be enough. We have a lot of smart people who know how to critically think. We need creative innovation. 
So the first one is collaboration, getting along, working in teams. Second one is communication. Third one, content. Fourth one, critical thinking. Fifth one, creative innovation. And last one, the confidence to put it all together. So now you must be saying by this point, where in the heck is this lady going? <clears throat> because it doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, I hope you see a little bit so far, right? Are we cool? Um, and it certainly doesn't have anything to do with our children. But in fact, it does. The children who you are working with today, the five and unders, they're the workforce of 2040. You have them. Right now, in your charge, you have tomorrow's workforce. Can you be more important than that? You have tomorrow's bankers, you have tomorrow's lawyers, and more importantly, you have tomorrow's artists. And they are in your hands. And what I want to suggest to you is if we want to have the goals of the six C's, the way that we're going to do it is by playful learning. So let me show you why I say that. First of all, high quality programs are characterized by playful environments. You've walked into those places that aren't any good. You know those really clean places where nothing's going on and it's quiet? <clears throat> you know those places where the toys are so high that the kids can't reach them? You know those? Okay? You know those places where you walk in and the teacher says, well, we now have five minutes for circle time. Five minutes is up. I don't care if you're in the middle of a sentence. You know those places? That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about places where the kids have great relationships with their caregivers. I'm talking about places where kids are engaged in active learning. And it doesn't matter where in the world you are. And the question that we need to be asking, what in the world happened to play? When did it become a four-letter word? So, in 81, we know that a typical school-aged child in the United States had 40% of her discretionary time for play. By 97, the time had shrunk down to 25%. I'm not even sure we're in the single digits now. All right? But let's look at the research. In the last two decades, David Elkind, who wrote The Hurry Child, suggested we have lost eight hours of free, uh, free play time per week. Thousands of schools in the United States, and I know this is happening in Chicago, despite the evidence, thousands of schools are dumping recess. Our kids need recess. How many of you have any boys in your charge? <clears throat> I will say no more. Our society is confusing learning with memorization. Our society is confusing test scores with success. Here's the challenge, guys, and the challenge is really one for all of us. How do we both enrich our kids' lives and make sure that we're fostering play so that our kids learn collaboration, communication, content, critical thinking, creative innovation, and confidence? And don't tell us it can't be done, because it can be done. Today I want to offer some evidence for playful learning by starting in, in, five, in five parts. First, to tell you that early education is important, but how you learn is as important as what you learn. I want to define playful learning because it's not an easy concept. It's not let the kids alone while you watch TV. Okay? It's not let them do whatever they want to while I oversee it. Okay? And hang in the corner sipping coffee. I know you don't do that. But I want you to truly understand what it is. I want to talk about playful learning in self-regulation, playful learning in academic outcomes, and then I want to talk about the implications of all this for you guys. All right, the evidence, how education is important, but how you learn is more important than what you learn. Preschool experience dramatically increases kids' collaboration. We know it. It increases their social skills by as much as 62%. It decreases kids' problem behaviors. It increases kids' communication skills by 25%. In content, we know that it increases reading by at least 59%, increases writing ability, and increases math scores. But it's not just what you learn, it's how you learn that matters. And there have been a lot of comparisons in the literature now between developmentally appropriate schools and the more traditional, what we'll call direct instruction, do it uh, the same way we've been doing it for many years approach. And that tells the story. Developmentally appropriate schools, schools that know what the kid is about, that gear their curriculum to the kid, that let the kid take the lead, have active learning, not passive learning, playful, guided learning. They take a whole child approach. So instead of saying, oh, now it's time for math, and then we're going to have reading time, they recognize 
that when you are planning for a birthday party, you got to write the invitations, you got to remember who you invited, you got to plan what's going to be at the party. When you cut the cake into 10 slices, you're doing fractions, right? Got it, guys? They know that. And they're not compartmentalizing. And they view a child as a discoverer and an explorer. But the direct instruction, the, pa the kids are sitting more passively. Learning is more compartmentalized. They're sitting there doing test prep in 79% of the New York schools, passively working on worksheets. Paper and pencil stuff, empty vessel metaphor. Now, the developmentally appropriate schools have a lot of advantages. In social emotional development, we know that those kids do better in emotion regulation. That goes under big duh, right? Kids are less likely to kick that kid off the swing, that's emotion regulation, okay, when they've had a chance to swing, okay? I mean, this is so simple, your grandmother could tell you. <clears throat> Sorry. I don't know where we've lost it. Common sense some, went somewhere. I'm still looking for it. Okay. It, in, it decreases child stress. It decreases behavior problems. And it increases their motivation for school. Another one. Duh. Right? Not a surprise here. But academically, those same kids do better on the test. Isn't that shocking? Than the ones who spent their time practicing it? Our kids do better because they really learned this stuff. What happens in direct instruction early childhood classrooms? We get more inattention, rest, restlessness, and stress. Decreased confidence in our own ability, right, because we never get to try anything. Less enjoyment of the challenge. Less end of year progress in motor language and social skills compared with their age mates in developmentally appropriate practices. And in fact, we know that what you learn in these developmentally appropriate rooms, it lasts over time. Let me give you some examples. Alfieri, last year. Two years ago, reviews 164 studies of young children along with studies of adults and adolescents that revealed that assisted discovery learning, view that as playful learning, okay, trumped both explicit instruction and unassisted discovery learning pedagogies. Bottom line is it works. Play and learning are not incompatible. Play is not just wasted free time. If it's used properly, it can be a deeply powerful tool to increase children's learning, math, and even science. So what do we mean by playful learning? Playful learning to me is two things. One, it contains time to have free play because it's in free play that children become bosses. When children have to fill up their own time, they need to learn management skills, true? When they have to find something to do on their own for a certain amount of time, they get smarter, not dumber. But it also means something else. Guided play. And guided play, in the way we're defining it right now, means two things. One is that you take the stuff in your environment and you arrange it so the kid is going to trip on just the right stuff. So the Montessori classroom is a really good example of that. It's not the only example. Okay? Children's museums do this all the time. Reggio Emilia does this all the time. What you do is if you want the kids to understand what's going on with triangles, then you need to have triangles around. You have to have things that are architecturally going to show you what a triangle does so that they can discover it. And should they all be the same triangle? No, they're not going to discover anything that way. They need to discover multiple triangles and zoom in and find out, so what really makes a triangle? What's the essence here? Everybody got it? Okay. That's number one. Is you populate your environment with the stuff you want your kids to learn. Guided play means... You're really letting the kid take the lead. But you have the stuff in the environment that's going to allow them to do that, and you're building on their interest to help make it even richer. All right, let's look at it. Playful learning in self-regulation, self-control, that ability to hold back, that ability to not want snack time an hour before snack time, okay? It's a tale of two Spocks. One Spock was Benjamin Spock, very famous writer, author, who uh, told our great-grandparents, how you should parent. And then there was Mr. Spock. All right, you all know Mr. Spock? Coming your way yet again. Star Trek is coming out in 3D. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Benjamin Spock got it all along. Social and emotional regulation mattered. Mr. Spock, did he ever get it? And Mr. Spock still doesn't get it. All right, emotion regulation. <clears throat> it's about impulse control. 
It's about self-guidance of your thought, thinking it through before you do it. Not all of us do that well. Sometimes I just do it. Um, it's about planning. It's about self-reliance and getting dressed on your own. It's about socially responsible behavior, acting in a morally good way. And by the way, when you learn that, you're learning a lot. You learn to be more persistent. You learn to have task mastery. Academic achievement goes with this. Social cooperation, maturity, moral maturity. You know what's right and what's wrong. Now I'm going to give you a good one. Any of you know the marshmallow task? I love the marshmallow task, right? Let's look at the marshmallow task. We have two marshmallows you put in front of your kid. <clears throat> your kid is four. Now you say to the kid, well, you sit here and I will be back in two minutes. Now don't eat the marshmallows. Okay? And if you're cool enough and you don't eat the marshmallows, I promise you I will give you both marshmallows when I get back. But if you cannot stand it, if you are dying, if you feel too much for you, ring this bell, and I will come back right away, and I will give you one of the marshmallows. Can you see this trade off here? Yeah. All right. So it's definitely worth, right? You get 100% gain by waiting the two minutes. Well, those kids work at it. All right. Some of them are like, huh, 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 right? Other the kids are like, no! Okay. <clears throat> and other kids ring the bell. All right, so it turns out it was done by a guy named Water Michelle. He's a uh, famous professor at Columbia University. And, you know, we always test out these first things, just like, you know, Gloria and Robert. I always tested out my studies with my kids. And, uh, and so he tested out with this kid. And his, he said, you know, I'm really curious. What happened to all those kids who flunked the marshmallow test? And he started talking, they said, oh, they did not go to schools that were anywhere near as good as the kids who passed the marshmallow test. They did a formal study. Catch this, catch this. Those who waited scored over 200 points better in their SATs. Years later, isn't that amazing? All right, but the exciting thing for us is that the kids who flunk the marshmallow test can be taught to have better social emotional control in those tasks where I told you about the mouth and the ear, this tools of the mind kind of task. All right, this stuff doesn't develop on its own. Everybody says, oh, worry about the academics. The social and emotional will take care of itself. That is not true. Kids don't just learn to share. Kids don't just learn to be polite. They don't just learn what's right, right and wrong in the world, and they certainly don't just learn to say please and thank you. Right? We got to help them. All right, let's look at playful learning and academic outcomes. You're doing it all the time. Tell stories. Every one of us has a story to tell. We're really good at outsourcing. We think, oh, I'm not a professional storyteller. I guess I have to take my kids to the library. That's not true. You all have stories to tell. It doesn't matter what the conversations are about. Let the kids talk about slugs. I hated slugs, but my middle son loves slugs. So guess what? We talked about slugs. All right, turns out that playful learning really works. There's a study that just came out. I really like it. It's by Han, Volkovich, and Buell. I don't really want you to memorize these little graphs. They're a little too fancy. What I do want to tell you is that what we do is we read the story, and in one condition, we read the story, and then we played afterwards. And in the other condition, we just read the story and talked about the words afterwards. And where do you think the highest bars are? Is it in the blue or the red? Can you tell? Think of blue as play and red as not play. Who wins? Got it? Playing works. Spatial skills, like playing with blocks, are really important to human intelligence as well. Like some of us can find our way places. I am not one of them. I rely solely on my GPS. Um, they're important to math outcomes. They're important um, in, in getting us situated for engineers. So you've heard about STEM? Any of you heard of STEM? It's like a big word these days. Science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, guess what? A lot of people are teaching engineering through Legos by learning how to do spatial learning. All right, so let me just take blocks. One day I get a call, city of New York, they're in panic. Come up here right away. Why? They are taking the blocks out of the classroom. I said, no, nah, that's too ridiculous. Nobody, nobody would take blocks out of the classroom. Oh, yes, it's starting to happen. So I said, okay, we'll have a research study just like we did with shoots and ladders, and we will show you that blocks are important. So we asked whether, kids, whether parents talk more about spatial terms when they're playing with blocks because we know that understanding things like middle, end, around, through, in, up, down, over, under, got it? Knowing that vocabulary actually relates to later mathematics ability. 
Do we think more about space in certain conditions over others? So we decided to take three and five year old kids. We had three conditions. One was a free play condition. Mega Blocks gave us the blocks. And we said, just go and play with any of the blocks you want to play with. Number two, we had a guided play condition. And in that, we sort of had an IKEA furniture sort of situation where we gave them these laminated instructions and said, could you build a heliport? Could you build a garage with your parent? And then in the other condition, we gave them the heliport. We gave them the garage. We just wanted to see what would happen in the pre-assembled condition. Here you can see the conditions. Over here, it's pre-assembled, just play with it. By the way, a lot of toys that you buy these days are like that. You don't get to put them together. Over here is the free play. The blocks come out of the bag. Do anything that you want. See our little IKEA stuff down here? Okay. All right. So the question is, what was going to prompt the most spatial language? And did any of these conditions, the free play, the guided play, whatever, work better over time? Now, we only had those three conditions at the beginning. Time one, we had a free play group. We had a pre-assembled group. We had a guided play group. Time two, everyone went into guided play. Now, are you ready for the results? All right. What you want to look at, remember everybody was in two conditions, a first condition and a second condition. And here they are. First condition, pre-assembled play, guided play. What do you see? Guided. Free play, guided play. Everybody, what wins? Over here, guided, guided. No difference. See it? So it turns out the context does make a difference. Turns out in guided play, 10% of the words you use, even though you don't know it, turn out to be rich spatial language words. Second, <clears throat> turns out that in non-block play, it turns out they only use it 3% of the time. Blocks are important for young kids' spatial learning. All right, the point. Playful learning can help children develop the 21st century skills. You know what they are now? Want to say them with me? Collaboration, communication, content, critical thinking, creative innovation, and confidence. Our job, the job of the people in this room, is to get the mission going. We're the ones who are the ambassadors. This isn't going to happen if we don't do it with the greatest natural resource that we have in this country. You know, a child today has to learn more than just the facts. They have to put those facts into a creative framework that's going to solve the problems of tomorrow. And I would argue that in 2040, what we are going to need to have are thinkers, because those thinkers are the only people who are going to get jobs. The rest of those straight-A students are going to be outsourced to India. I believe that the six C's can be the next report card, and that while the kids are doing the next report card, believe it or not, they'll also be happy and well-adjusted human beings. Thank you.